Hello, we will be discussing change management in the emergency department. My name is Jamie Aranda. I am a medical director at Freighter Emergency Department and assistant professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I do have some suggested resources here that are of my own recommendation, but not necessarily reflective of SAEM endorsement. So we are going to be discussing what is change management, the features of change, why change is important, challenges of change management, we'll review adopter categories and a model for change management, as well as strategies for success. Change management is a structured approach to implementing change in an organization. The features of change. So change can be particularly difficult and it often fails. There is not a whole lot of objective evidence on this. However, many experts have been quoted as saying roughly 70% of change initiatives fail. It does require stages or iterative processes to make real transformation. Skipping necessary steps does not always result in true change and critical mistakes along the way can cause derailment. I like to think of change management as a little bit of um, kind of an evolutionary process. So we do make small changes or um, improvements along the way, um, but it really takes a lot of time and investment of a great deal of energy. Uh, some leaders have been quoted as saying between five and seven years are required to make significant transformation in an organization. And it requires the aggressive cooperation of many individuals. And I really like that term aggressive cooperation because I do feel that if any group of people can achieve aggressive cooperation, it is emergency physicians and frontline staff. Why is change important? So as a leader, whether you're a medical director or you're involved in operations, or even if you work for a private group and you may be asked to lead some committee work or task force, work, it will be necessary for you to lead change. Um, some examples of this include staffing model changes, patient care updates such as new processes, clinical decision pathways or workflows, as well as implementation of new technology. I want to show you a slide of patient arrivals by day through 2020 and the first half of 2021. You can see here our day-to-day -day variation of patient arrivals is highly variable. And in addition, although we had a big drop off during our COVID pandemic, there was a return to roughly 95% of our baseline mean patient arrivals. However, I'd like to draw your attention to this part of the graph off to the right side, where you can see that our patient arrival volumes are even creeping up past our previous mean. So even though we have been able to implement change during our pandemic and in our post recovery period, what's worked for us during that time is not going to work for us for the future. We are constantly needing to adapt and improve our patient flow. Why does change management fail? So, I alluded to the challenges of change management previously. Um, however, um, physicians are particularly skeptical of corporate strategic agendas, and oftentimes top-down mandates are met with resistance, especially if they're coming from outside of your department or people that don't work clinically. And there can often be a disconnect between the organizational goals and frontline staff concerns, um, which may include staffing, working conditions, um, access to PPE, and this can breed resentment, cynicism, lack of trust, and poor engagement. And it is our job to address some of these challenges to, or in order to make successful change. Next, I'm going to talk about adopter categories. So this comes from the Diffusion of Innovations, um, which is a book written in 1962 by Everett Rogers. It highlights here um, that there are likely different categories of people within a society that will adopt new ideas and technology. And you can see over on the far left side, we have our innovators, our early adapters. 
these are people that are going to readily adapt to change and agree to, you know, changing their process and trying new things. There's the early and late majority, which is, you know, most of the people in our practice. And then over on the right side, I you can see that there's a group of people that tend to be hesitant to change. They might be highly skeptical or they might just outright resist any sort of change. One thing you can do is um, as a leader, if you know who these individuals are that are in this these categories, it can be really helpful to get some of those innovators and early adapters on board as champions. And you may even consider reaching out to somebody that you view as a laggard or a resistor and recruit them to be a champion of your process. Um, be careful though, because this can backfire if they really <laughs> are resistant to change. But converting somebody from um, you know, a late majority or laggard into an early champion can be one way to improve adoption of a new process. I'm going to discuss a model for change management. Uh, this is just one example of a change management uh, guide uh, called ADCAR. And it's nice because it's pretty simple and straightforward. It's easy to remember. Um, it's been around for 20 years or so, and so there are lots of courses and materials available, including this excellent book written by uh, Jeff Hyatt, and we'll go through each, um, each uh, letter in the acronym here separately on some upcoming slides, but essentially A stands for awareness for the need for change, D is for desire to support and participate in the change, K is knowledge of how to change. A is ability to implement required skills and behaviors. And R is reinforcement to sustain the change. Awareness is, as we mentioned, to create awareness of the need for change. Um, and a person is aware of and understands the need for change if they can understand the nature of the change why it is needed, and what the risks are of not implementing the change. So I really think that this mirrors our conversations that we have with our patients on a daily basis as we go through the risks and benefits for various treatments, testing, um, and procedures in the emergency department. Um, I also you know, would like to bring up that this is a really important time to establish urgency and you know we want to be truthful and not exaggerate the need for a change but if there are going to be you know major impacts due to regular regulatory compliance issues or um, compensation it's really important to make that um, known to the individuals that you're asking to implement the change so that they can have the appropriate level of urgency. D is for desire or the motivation and ultimate choice to support and participate in a change. This might be the hardest step. Awareness does not automatically translate into desire. We like to use the WIIFM or what's in it for me uh, frame of thinking. So if you are asking a staff member to take the time and effort to change their normal workflow, it's really important to identify the reasons behind that change and what will actually benefit that individual, the department, or the patient in order to create desire to participate in the change. Next is knowledge. So if I can understand the need for the change and I'm willing to change, can I reasonably expect that the change will happen? Like, what are the barriers to this change actually being implemented? Oftentimes, it can involve training and education on new skills or behaviors that are needed. And of course, we love providing detailed information on how to use new processes, systems, and tools, which may come in the form of emails or detailed instructions with screenshots. Other times you can make pathways or documents immediately available to people working on shift. Um, and then utilizing the electronic health record with different tools or order sets um, 
can also be helpful. Um, it's important that people understand their new roles and responsibilities that are associated with the change. Ability. This is the demonstrated capability to implement the change and achieve the desired performance. There may be multiple barriers, including psychological barriers, physical abilities, intellectual capability, the time available to develop the needed skills, and the availability of resources to support the development of new abilities. So just as awareness does not automatically translate into desire, knowledge does not automatically translate into ability. Oftentimes it can be beneficial to set a trial date or some periods where we can practice running the process for a short period of time to see what sort of barriers exist and to make sure that our staff have the appropriate skill set and that they can execute the change needed. Then we can set a go live date and actually begin the new change. R is reinforcement. So the degree to which reinforcement is meaningful to the person impacted by the change may influence whether or not they participate in the change. There should be an association of the reinforcement with the actual demonstrated progress or accomplishment. Oftentimes we can recognize individuals for being good champions or successfully implementing a change. There should be an absence of negative consequences. So if we're very interested in length of stay and turnaround time, and then we were to implement a new change um, involving a lengthy, uh, perhaps cumbersome transfer process, that would automatically have a negative impact on other metrics that we're measuring, such as length of stay. So it may be a deterrent to faculty to participate in that new change of the time-consuming transfer process. There should be an accountability system for ongoing tracking and reinforcement of the change. Oftentimes we can set goals and develop metrics to see if we are achieving those goals and then we can track it over time and determine if we are successfully participating in the change. Finally, um, employees matter and their contributions should be noticed and valued. So even if you have um, reinforcement in place such as celebrations or um, parties or recognition and that sort of thing, just telling people that you appreciate their time and effort and recognizing their work can be particularly valuable. In conclusion, I'm going to review some strategies for success. Rounding and listening or Gemba walk is critical to each stage of the change management process, including before, during, and after during the reinforcement stage. Identify shared goals and purpose, creating teams and support project work. So this can be really important for engaging nurses, residents, frontline staff, and faculty to participate in a change. Proactively address cynicism, including working closely with those who are resistant to change or laggards. Articulate promises clearly. Send clear messaging to all staff. So be sure that um, residents, students, faculty, nurses, all who are affected by the change are given messaging that is congruent and in a similar time frame. Following through leads to gain and trust. We recently implemented a staffing change in our department that impacted nursing, techs, our communicators, even specialties outside of our department. It was very important that we reach out and seek input from all of these groups and then that we circle back and let them know that we took their input seriously and made appropriate changes. Finally, bring people along, develop and empower them. It's important that we develop leaders around us and not just dictate or manage others, and this will help gain support for any sort of change management process. We can't be there every day, every minute, so it is important to identify champions and leaders and empower them to do their best work.
Thank you very much.